the most important battle we will ever engage is the battle for our inner world. I know that if I can stand in this pain, I can face whatever pain is ahead of me. And what a lot of us don't realize is that our greatness is on the other side of our pain. Because your pain is not the limitation of your capacity. Failure is an illusion. Failure is not real. People who believe they cannot fail do not risk. We think we become powerless when we abdicate responsibility, but actually we become powerful when we take ownership of our lives. And the most important battle that you will ever fight, the most important battle we will ever engage is the battle for our inner world. And it doesn't come by accident. That inner peace comes through a challenge, through a battle, through a struggle. And I don't know about you, but I, I face so many challenges in my life. I've lived 60 years now, and I've seen so many obstacles and challenges and failures and disappointments. I've also seen incredible successes, and I've seen so many incredible, beautiful things happen through my life. But the battle within me rages every single day. So I want to just take a few moments and talk about some self-limiting beliefs that keep us from the life that we're created to live, that limit us when the reality is that those limitations are completely internally created. Two years ago, I walked into a doctor's office with my wife, and it was just a routine visit because I couldn't get life insurance. I, I, I spent about 10 years unable to get a key man policy for the business that I was running, and my partner really wanted a key man policy so that if I died, she would be taken care of. And, and I kept going and taking all these different tests, and I kept failing the different tests. And they couldn't find anything wrong with me, but they kept telling me, we can't find anything wrong, but you cannot get life insurance. And so 10 years later, I'm going back to a doctor because I called a doctor friend of mine and I said, look, I've never been good at tests. I keep failing these tests. I need a doctor who can help me like you help a college athlete. I need help passing this test. And my friend who's a doctor said, Erwin, that's illegal, but I will send you to a doctor. He'll take you through the process. And so we went in and I thought, today I'm going to get a clean bill of health and I'm going to get to finally get life insurance. And this doctor looked at me and he said, you have cancer. And they said of the eight Places they biopsied, you have level four and five cancer in five of them, and we need to move you into surgery within the next few weeks. And when you hear that declared over you, you have cancer, it's like you hear someone say to you, you're dying. And one of the most interesting things that happened in my own life was the process through that cancer. They put me under the knife. It was supposed to be a two-hour surgery. It was a six-and-a-half-hour surgery. It was more complicated and, and more encompassing than they thought. And they finally put me in my hospital room at 9 p.m. after six and a half hours of surgery. And I woke up at midnight and I saw my wife sleeping next to me. And I woke her up and she thought something was wrong. And she goes, are you okay? And I said, yes. I said, I just woke up. And I said, I, I want to get up and I want to walk. And my wife panicked on me. She says, you cannot get up and walk. You just had six hours of surgery. You're not getting up. You're staying in bed. And I said, no, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk. And she says, you're not. And so she snitched me out, called the nurse. The nurse came over. And she goes, what's going on? What's wrong? And my wife said, he thinks he's going to get up and walk. Can you tell him he cannot get up and walk? And, and the nurse said, sir, you cannot get up. You, Mr. McManus, you need to stay in bed. And I said, look, I have six holes in my stomach. Can I do any more damage if I get up? She goes, well, technically, no. I said, then I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk. And then she said, well, then you need a lot of medication. You're going to need some pretty significant painkillers if you're going to get out of this bed. And I looked at her and I said, no, I don't, I don't want any medication. This is the whole point. I know that if I can stand in this pain, I can face whatever pain is ahead of me. And what a lot of us don't realize is that our greatness is on the other side of our pain. We live in a mythology of greatness where greatness looks so easy. Have you ever looked around and thought, wow, that looks so good. That looks so easy. I, I, I mean, Kobe made it look easy. MJ made it look easy. Tyre Woods made it look easy. Serena Williams makes it look easy. When you watch the best in the world, you're looking at it going, I could do that. That's so easy. Then you try to do it, and you realize there's nothing easy about it. But what's happened in our society is that we get glimpses of greatness without any connection to the process that achieves that level of greatness. So we've created an internal narrative that if I am intrinsically great at something, it should come easy. And we have a generation that doesn't know that their greatness is on the other side of their pain. And so we create all this technology for recovery to enhance performance. 
What we really need to do is to build an internal framework that says your pain is not the limitation of your capacity. And when I got out of that bed and I stood up, it hurt so bad. I mean, I wish I could tell you that something supernatural happened and I felt no pain at all, but that's not true. It was not the best moment of my life. When I stood there, I was in agonizing pain, and I thought to myself, can I take the first step? And so I took one step, and then I took two steps, and I took three, and then four. And then when I got to the edge of the bed, they thought I was going to turn toward the bathroom, but there was no point. I had a catheter. And if you don't know what a catheter is, it's a medical term for male humiliation. And, and I took a hard right walk out the door and went walking down the hall, and every single step hurt. But one of the things you learn over a lifetime is that if you actually care about something, if you want to achieve a level of greatness, if you want to move to a level of excellence, if you want to optimize your capacity, you have to understand that pain is a part of the process to achieve whatever level of greatness you long to achieve. And wouldn't it be exciting if we actually had a positive relationship with pain? Instead of going, I'm going to avoid pain, you say, I'm going to step into that pain and actually learn to embrace pain and take on more and more of it until I actually master that pain and it doesn't have mastery over me. Your greatness is on the other side of your pain, but another dynamic, another mindset that has to ship inside of us is that our, our future is actually on the other side of our failures. I was just talking to this life coach and he, he speaks across the world and he's incredibly influential and, and while we're having coffee together, he said, Erwin, failure is an illusion. Failure is not real. And I knew what he was saying. Failure is a mindset. It's a construct. But, but to be really, really honest with you, I have failed too many times for me to put failure into the illusion category. Because if failure is an illusion, I've just been living a nightmare. The reality is that, that there's this odd psychological dynamic. People who believe they cannot fail do not risk. I've actually interviewed people. I remember once I had a man on my team. And we were in the middle of a huge failure, and I sat down with him, and I tried to get him to help to take ownership over his failure, but he wouldn't even see it. And he looked at me dead in the eye, and he said, I have never failed. And I said, you've never failed. He said, never. Not even, like, right now. He said, never. And what I realized is that he had developed this internal construct that takes no responsibility over personal failure. And here's an odd kind of dynamic. People who displace responsibility actually take lower risks and are less resilient. People who take ownership over failure actually are more resilient and are more willing to take on great risks. See, if your mindset is, I never fail, you'll make sure you play it safe so that you never violate your view of yourself. But if you're a person that says, you know, I use failure as the material from which I create my future, then you just step into risk after risk after risk because you're not shocked when you fail. I remember once I stepped into an organization and they had just come out of a huge catastrophe and I called all the executives in and I, and I sat down with them. I said, look, I'm new here, so I need to know whose responsibility was this particular endeavor, whose responsibility was the failure that we just experienced. And one by one, they went around the room. It wasn't me, it's not my responsibility, not my responsibility, not my area, not my department. No, it wasn't me. And every single person in that room said, not my responsibility. So I finally said, okay, you only have one job, to go find the person who's responsible for this failure. Now, they were all ready to go do that. And I said, and when you find them, let me know who they are, because I'm going to hire them and fire all of you. Because I need the person who can own the failure in the room. We think we become powerless when we abdicate responsibility, but actually we become powerful when we take ownership of our lives. Have you ever listened to people in their victim mentality? Saying, well, you know, someone did this to me or, or, or well, that this is why it happened to me. It's, it's my parents' fault, it's the, the government's fault, it's religion's fault, it's my, my, my wife's fault, my husband's fault. As long as you're displacing responsibility, you are actually relinquishing all of your power.